But today we're going to look at what happens if you miss out on the second chances and you pass away. Of course, you'd like your next generation, you'd like your, your, your children not to fall into the same trap that you have been through. Because sometimes the Bible says that sometimes the mistakes made by the parents, the children end up paying for it. Not physically, but the consequences. Imagine a father who has a great saving falls into um, gambling and blows all his savings away. What would happen to the kids? Of course, their future will be worse than what it would have been if they were not to fall into that kind of gambling addiction. So what happens then if something like that happens? Does God still care about the, our next generation? Does God still care about our children or our children's children? Yes, he does. And we're going to look at um, what happens if something like that happens to anyone. Because God is no respecter of person. He might have done it for people in the Bible, and he's happy. He's more than willing to do the same for you. Amen? Who knows Steve Jobs? Anyone? Not personally, I mean, but you've heard of him. Okay. <laughs> Michael Jordan. Steven Spielberg. Jerry Seinfeld. Oprah Winfrey. Or even Walt Disney. All the kids knows him. Steve Jobs was removed from the company he started. Michael Jordan was cut off from his high school basketball team. Steven Spielberg got rejected from film school three times. Jerry Seinfeld was booed off stage. Oprah Winfrey was told she was unfit for TV. Walt Disney was told a mouse would never work. These are people who are now famous and considered successful. If they faced failures before, but now they are famous, that means they must have had a second chance. Maybe the second chance was given to them after their own perseverance or resilience were displayed. Some people never saw the blessing that was pronounced over them. For example, in the Bible, Abraham probably looked at the stars many times, but never saw the nations that came from his descendants. It happened because God himself pronounced the blessing over him. He see, we see that from time to time in the Bible where a prophet would speak over someone and what is said eventually happened because the prophecy didn't come from him. It came from God. Amen? But we also saw curses being pronounced over people in the Bible. Most of the times they would be Judgment pronounced over them by God due to the things that they have done. Sometimes they are given opportunities, many of them, to repent. Sometimes when they have gone too far, their life is taken away from them. In the Bible, it is customary for fathers to pronounce blessings, which is called patriarchal benediction, over their children when they felt that they were close to their death. And today we will look at, or look in part, what Jacob, who you know was the son of um, Isaac, and Isaac was the son of Abraham, and Jacob, who was also named Israel. And uh, we'll look at what was pronounced, what he pronounced as patriarchal benediction over his children before he died. Are you ready? Okay. Let's go. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this morning. We thank you for the privilege that you have given to us because it's by your grace that we are here. It's by your grace that we have been saved. And we thank you, Father, for there is nothing that can prevent you from loving us. And it's your love that was extended to earth so that we could be reunited with the Father. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for your death and resurrection without which we wouldn't be where we are today. We thank you for this morning. We pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit is going to fall afresh on everyone. Cover us with your blessings, Father. Help us, Lord, to hear with the circumcised ear that you talk about in your word. And help us, Lord, to walk out of this place changed, renewed, 
improved. And we pray, Father, that you will help me to unfold the things that you have set in my heart. Help me, Lord, to speak the truth that you have set in your words. Help me, Lord, to dissect the things and elaborate and help um, me to understand the things that you are saying, not just to the congregation, not just to the people, but to myself also. We thank you, Father. We pray, Lord, that we will be blessed, all of us, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you've got your Bible, I'd like you to open uh, in Genesis 49 from 5 to 7. Genesis 49 from 5 to 7, and it should be on the screen now. Now, this is, uh, I'll just give you a brief, uh, I'm, I haven't taken the whole text, I've taken only part of it, and uh, this is Jacob now on his deathbed, and he called his son, he said, come, I'm going to go and meet my maker, I'm going to die, I'm going to pass away, I'm going to leave you, but this is my benediction, this is my blessings before I leave the earth, and this is what I have to say. And he started talking from talking to uh, um, the, the eldest one, Reuben, and so on, and then he came to Simeon and Levi. Now, we need to understand one thing. Um, Jacob was married to Leah first, his first wife, but he didn't want to marry Leah, and you can go um, in, through this text or, or through the, the life of Jacob, it would really help you to understand the context that we are trying to get into this text this morning because it's important for you to understand where the children come from, who they are. And they are, some of them are stepbrothers. And in those days, if a, a wife cannot have children, she was allowed to give her maid servant to the husband to have children for her. It's same as surrogate mothers that we have today. So in those days, it was uh, a, a tradition. It was allowed, and, and God blessed the people, even though uh, they were doing such things in those days. In nowadays, today, this would be considered as you know extramarital affair or something like that. But let's look into the context of this. So he is on his deathbed, and he's talking, he's blessing his children. And he came to Simeon and Levi, and he said this, Simeon and Levi are brothers. Their swords are weapons of violence. Let me not enter their council. Let me not join their assembly. For they have killed men in their anger and hamstrung oxen as they pleased, like for fun, for sport. And then he said, Cursed be their anger, so fierce, and their fury, so cruel. I will scatter them in Jacob and disperse them in Israel. Doesn't sound like a blessing to me. It's more like a curse. Now, I've, I have uh, on purpose taken three versions of verse 6 where he said this. So NIV says this in this version, let me not enter their council, let me not join their assembly, for they have killed men in their anger and hamstrung oxen as they pleased. If you go to the King James Version, it says, O my soul, come not thou into their secret, unto, unto their assembly. Mine honor be not thou united, for in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will... They dig a hole. They dig down a wall. We can see that there is a difference between the text, but it means the same thing, and I'll explain. Into their secret. Let's look at the um, the uh, the uh, the, uh, the LSV version now. It said, "Into their secret, do not come, O my soul. Do not be united to their assembly, O my glory. For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will." eradicated a prince. Now, first it's saying he's hamstring, they are hamstringing an oxen. And then the other version said they are digging down a wall. And then they say they are eradicating a prince. And if we go through the text, we will understand a bit further. So, to dig down a wall, it means like to uproot the whole wall. 
is to remove the foundation, which means that no wall can be built after that unless you lay new foundation. It's like you cut a tree, a stump. I don't know if you remember. It was like the, the, the Nebuchadnezzar when he, for seven years, he went and became like a wild animal. And then he came to his senses because he, um, he said things to glorify himself rather than giving glory to God. And the image that was given is a stump that was cut. And after time, what happens is new shoot starts to grow and tree, the tree will reappear. It will be as strong, maybe not as strong as the other one, but the roots are still there and the root will cause the tree to grow again. And this is what the Bible is talking. But if you uproot the whole thing, the whole stump, no tree is ever going to grow in that place. You agree? Because the root is gone, the foundation is gone for the wall. And they say eradicated the prince, which means that if you remove the government, you remove the king, the prince, that means that there is no descendant for that king. The whole generation, the whole lineage has been erased completely. Why is Jacob saying such a thing to his two sons? Now, we have to go back in history and see what happens. Because after speaking to his sons, Jacob died in 1859 B.C. That's 1859 B.C. Why was he so harsh with Simeon and Levi? What Jacob said really happened because both tribes were scattered over Israel. We see it when the 12 tribes of Israel were formed and allotment, like um, land was given to them. They were scattered over all Israel. Let's see what happened 47 years before he died, before Jacob died. So this morning is going to be more like a Bible study, and we're going to extract lessons. We're going to extract what God has to say. Amen? And we're going to open our Bibles to Gen Genesis 34, and we're going to unfold verse by verse as we go. How's that going? Good? Good. Okay, Genesis 34. I'm going to read from verse 1, and we are going to look at each verse or group of verses as we go. The Bible says the one day, Dinah. Dinah is Jacob's only daughter. He had only one daughter. The daughter of Jacob and Leah went to visit some of the young women who lived in the area. Now, Jacob went away. I don't know if you remember that he stole the birthright of his, father, of his brother. He lied to his uh, father and took the benediction from his father that was supposed to go to his elder brother and then his brother said I'm going to kill you so he left with the complicity with uh, of his mother he left and went to his mother's brother Laban and stayed there for 14 years because he fell in love with Laban's daughter Rachel and Laban said okay if you want my daughter to be married to to marry you have to work for me for seven years. And he got married after seven years. But the day after the wedding, he realized that it was not Rachel. He got married to a cross-eyed girl, Leah, the elder daughter that he didn't want. But nevertheless, Laban came and said, okay, you want Rachel? Another seven years. And he was so in love with Rachel that he agreed. So, so he worked under the seven years. So he, under, he was under Laban service for 14 years. And then after that, he grew stronger. He had his own flocks. He had maid servants. He had people working with him. So he had a big team. He became very successful there. Not through the normal ways. If you read the story, you'll find out. So now he decided, because God said, it's time for you to go back to your forefathers, back to your parents. And he's leaving Laban in, uh, in Sharan. And he is going back to his brother. But he is scared. Everyone would be. Because his brother wanted to kill him. And now 14 years later he's coming back. And the brother is going to wait for him with 400 men. Ready to kill everyone on their path. But God had his eyes on Jacob. Because from him would come the children of Israel. So in, when he came back, he said he meet with, with and, and a miracle happened. He encountered God for the second time in Bethel. 
And then uh, um, God said, don't worry, I will take care of you. And he met his brother. His brother had compassion, cried and said, no, forget about everything. I'm not going to kill you. So you stay here and uh, we're going to see each other. So they got to see each other. They buried their father and uh, things continued that way. But where he was staying, he bought a block of land next to a town where the Canaanites were living. Now, the Canaanites were not very good people. They had their own law, and um, we see that even in, during the history uh, of Israel, when they, the Exodus, when they moved from Egypt to Canaan, the land that was given to them, they had to fight a lot of the Canaanites. And here is Jacob now next to this small town. And they didn't mix because they were considered as strangers. But Dinah, the daughter, one day decided to go and visit some of the young women, and I believe she was not allowed. Dinah was probably about 16 or 17 years old when she and her maidservant slipped out without Jacob's permission to see the customs and traditions of the locals. This probably happened during a festival where the locals would celebrate wearing special clothing and eating special food. It is implied by the scholars that it's not the first time that she went out to see the locals. We need to note that Jacob was not very strict with his people or his, even, or his children, even when it came to worshipping the only one true God. For at that time, some of them had, had idols in their possession. So this is for you just to, to... I'm trying to brush a picture so that you can see what was already happening in the surrounding and, and in Jacob's family. Verse 2, when the local prince Shechem, son of Hamor, the Hivite, saw Dinah, he seized her and raped her. One scholar clearly said that Dinah went to sea, but probably also to be seen, for she knew there would be young men also there at the festival. She paid the full penalty of her carelessness. Note that Note here that Sarah and Rebecca, like mother, sorry, not mother, but uh, grandma, mother and grand, grandmother, nearly encountered the same situation years earlier. So it was common for the kings and princes when they see a young, beautiful woman or, or a beautiful woman, they would say, okay, well, I want to sleep with her. So it was common for them because they felt like it's within their rights or within their power, and they could do whatever they want. But with Sarah and Rebecca, we see that God intervened and changed the situation. But for Dinah, things didn't happen because she put herself in that kind of danger. This is not to say that it's her fault, okay, for what happened to her, but only to mention that she should have been more careful about who she mingled with. Because to Jacob and his family, these people were strangers. The Bible clearly says that bad company corrupts good character. Bad company corrupts good character. And the lesson that we can take from here is we cannot expect God to protect us if we keep putting ourselves at risks. This could be having friends who has the ability to pull you or to pull me away from God. It doesn't happen overnight, but eventually it will happen. Since the devil is here to steal, kill, and destroy. Don't date the wrong person and expect a happy marriage. Verse 3. But then he fell in love with Dinah, and he tried to win her affection with tender words. Maybe he was genuine about his affection. Maybe he really fell in love with her. But maybe he was also trying to comfort her by telling her that he will marry her. Verse 4, he said to his father, Hamor, get me this young girl. I want to marry her. Being a powerful person, he could have just sent her to her home. But he didn't. He kept her in the palace and now tried to mend things through a marriage. Soon Jacob heard that Shechem had defiled his daughter, Dinah. But since his son, that's verse 5, 
Soon Jacob heard that Shechem had defiled his daughter Dinah, but since his sons were out in the fields herding his livestock, he said nothing until they returned. Jacob probably heard it from the maid servants who accompanied Dinah because she would not go alone. But he said nothing until his sons came home. Jacob was probably shocked, sorrowful, cautious, or even didn't know how to react. Some scholars believe his passivity shows some weakness in his leadership. How would you react? How would you react? Wouldn't you want to know or see where she is if that was your daughter? We see the same pattern when Joseph was supposedly killed by a wild animal. He didn't go to look for Joseph. He just heard what the brothers were saying and he just believed them. Even though he knew that they were jealous of Joseph, it was known because he, Joseph was his favorite child after all. He made a coat of many colors for him and displayed his love for him. If you heard that your son or daughter has been injured at school and taken to hospital, would you stay at home and wait for the doctor to call you? What would you do? Get in the car and drive to the school. If she's still there or if she's been taken to hospital, you go straight there. That's the kind of love that God expects us to show to others, let alone his people being our own children. Hamor, verse 6. Hamor, Shechem's father, came to discuss the matter with Jacob. Meanwhile, Jacob's sons had come in from the field as soon as they heard what had happened. Look at the reaction of the brother. The, the father stayed at home and waited for them to come. But for them, as soon as they heard, they came straight home. Because they, they needed to sort it. They felt like they should sort it. They were shocked and furious that their sister had been raped. Shechem had done a disgraceful thing against Jacob's family, something that should never be done. One scholar mentions an opinion still entertained in the East, which explains the excessive outrage of Dinah's brothers. It says this, In those countries, and you'll see that also when they talk about honor killing, in those countries, it is thought that a brother is more dishonored by the seduction of his sister than a man by the infidelity of his wife. For, say the Arabs, a man divorces his wife and then she's no longer his, while a sister and daughter always remain a sister and a daughter. Verse 8, Hamor tried to speak with Jacob and his sons. My son Shechem is truly in love with your daughter, he said. Please let him marry her. In fact, let's arrange other marriages too. You give us your daughters for our sons, and we will give you our daughters for your sons. And you may live among us. The land is open to you. Settle here and trade with us and feel free to buy property in the area. Sounds like a good deal. He didn't apologize for that. He didn't even apologize for what happened to Dinah or to, Joseph or to Jacob or to the brothers. Because Hamor's proposal was considered by himself as a practical admission of his son's guilt. He probably felt that, okay, because I'm making this big move now, I'm allowing them, I'm opening the city to them, maybe they will understand that, okay, my son is at fault here. I'm trying to repair the damage. Verse 11, then Shechem himself spoke to Dinah's father and brothers, please be kind to me and let me marry her, he begged. I will give you whatever you ask, no matter what dowry or gift you demand. I will gladly pay it. Just give me the girl as my wife. He was so in love that he was willing to give anything, all his riches included, anything in return for Dinah to marry him. Verse 13. 
But since Shechem had defiled their sister Dinah, Jacob's sons responded deceitfully to Shechem and his father Hamor. His, they said to them, okay, we couldn't possibly allow this because you are, so, we are not circumcised. It would be a disgrace for our sister to marry a man like you. But there is a solution. Here it is. If every man among you will be circumcised like we are, then we will give you our daughters and we will take your daughters for ourselves. We will live among you and become one people. But if you don't agree to be circumcised, we will take her and be on our way. This seems a bit dodgy. I mean, we know it's dodgy because the Bible says that it was with deception. If there was deceitfulness in it. But if, there, if the Bible didn't mention that they responded deceitfully, it would have sounded like that's a good deal. If he could show that there was no deception, or oh sorry, they could show that there was no deception in what they were doing, we could say that's a good deal. They're trying to do something. But this proposal, even if we didn't know that there was deception in it, was wrong. First, because they had no intention of honoring it, of course. But even if they honored this, it would still be wrong. Why? I'm glad you asked. First, they had no right to offer the sign of God's covenant to a heathen people. God said, this is my covenant to you, Abraham. So circumcision was a deal made between God and one person. That was his offer. Now, we can't take that offer and give that to someone else. They had less right, number two, they had less right to use it to authorize an agreement between humans. Because circumcision was something between God and human, not between human and another human. Number three, they had the least right to use it deceitfully. It's like you're using something which God has called sacred at that time, and which is still, because we are still under a new covenant now, it still has the same kind of importance that it had, it had in those days. It's like we are using that deceitfully, and it's wrong. So the lesson that we can take from, here, from this is this. A godly action, a godly action, a good action with the wrong motive is not godly anymore. Since it has already been tarnished with the wrong motive. For example, one way of expressing our covenant with God is through baptism. That's our covenant. We don't have to be circumcised. Thank God for that. That is our circumcision when we take the step of being baptized. So that was, that's why baptism is a very important thing. You cannot say to someone, oh, you get baptized, you know, everything will be fine. Oh, now you're a Christian, you have to get baptized. No, it has to come from within. We shouldn't coerce someone to be baptized because that is a covenant between that person and God. It's a public display. Baptism is a public display like signing a marriage certificate. If you don't want to be married, don't sign. Or maybe you want to get married because she or he is very wealthy. Then the motive is wrong. Yes, it is a good action being married to the person and dedicating your life to live together in peace and harmony, but the motive is wrong. The, the certificate, the marriage certificate, does not mean anything in the marriage, does not mean anything if the marriage is falling apart. So you can't say to someone, I love you, but I'm a Christian. So if you come to church, you become a Christian, you get baptized, I'm happy to marry you. You can't say that to a girl. Or a girl can't say that to someone because then you're coercing that person to do something that he, did, he didn't want. 
and you are forcing him into a relationship with God that maybe he didn't want or he wasn't ready for it. So we need to be very careful when we push people to do things that are godly, but the motive is wrong. Verse 18. Hamor and his son Shechem agreed to their proposal because they didn't know it was full of deception. Shechem wasted no time in acting on this request, for he wanted Jacob's daughter desperately. Shechem was a highly respected member of his family, and he went with his father Hamor to present this proposal to the leaders at the town gate. And they said, these men are our friends, they said. Let's invite them to live here among us and trade freely. Look, the land is large enough to hold them. We can take their daughters as wives and let them marry ours. But they will consider staying here and becoming one people with us only if all our men are circumcised just as they are. Now, they probably assume that they're going to refuse, that the people in, in the town are going to refuse. And that's why verse 23 says this, But if we do this, all their livestock and possessions will eventually be ours. Because Jacob was very blessed. Come, let's agree to their, let's agree to their terms and let them settle here among us. So all the men in the town council agreed with Hamor and Shechem, and every male in the town, in the town was circumcised. The Bible says that Shechem wasted no time, for he was madly in love. People do crazy things when they are madly in love. <laughs> Circumcision was common among Egyptians and Colchis area, which is a coastal region of the Black Sea. It was originated by God through Abraham, but other nations did it also as an act of religious or priestly consecration. So the people at the town gate agreed to do it since it would make them rich through Jacob's blessed possessions. You can't do something like that because God chose to bless Jacob, not these people. Verse 25, but three days later, when their wounds were still sore, two of Jacob's sons, Simeon and Levi, and now you'll understand what's going to happen and why Jacob is not happy even on his deathbed. Jacob, sorry, Simeon and Levi, who were Dinah's full brothers, took their swords and entered the town without opposition. Then they slaughtered every male there, including Hamor and his son Shechem. This is the ox. This is the wall that they were digging up. And this is the prince that they were eradicating. They killed them with their swords, then took Dinah from Shechem's house and returned to their camp. Terrible. Barbaric. On the third day is usually the time when a wound can cause infection, inflammation, severe pain, and fever. And where that wound is, you can't run very far. Verse 27. Meanwhile, the rest of Jacob's sons arrived, finding the men slaughtered. They plundered the town because their sister had been defiled there. They seized all the flocks and herds and donkeys, everything they could lay their hands on both inside the, ha the town and outside in the fields. They looted all their wealth and plundered their houses. They also took all their little children and wives and led them away as captives. Utterly barbaric. And that's why Jacob never came to terms with it. I can understand killing Shechem or anyone who has helped him in committing this terrible crime against Dinah. But the other men, what did they do? Shechem didn't go and ask permission in, at the town gate where all the important people were living, were staying, sorry, were spending time. He didn't go and consult them and say, oh, 
Can I have this girl? No. It was out of his own folly. It was out of his own madness. He was probably drunk. We don't know what pushed him to do something like that. The widows and the children taken as captive. What did they do wrong? If it was the man who was supposed to do something that bad. One girl gets raped and all the males in town die. Does that seem fair to you? Not at all. Now, I'm not a judge to assess how atrocious the crime was or to sentence the criminal, but to me, this punishment exceeds the crime. Afterward, verse 30, Afterward, Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, You have ruined me. You made, you've made me a stink among all the people of this land, among all the Canaanites and Perizzites. We are so few that they will join forces and crush us. I will be ruined and my entire household will be wiped out. Can you see Jacob's reaction here? He's more worried about himself. It is interesting to see that Jacob is speaking to Simeon and Levi about his own danger rather than their guilt. Scholars believe that they probably did not feel guilty because we see at the end of the, of the story how their reaction stayed stern in the same direction. Did not feel guilty about what they had done. Maybe Jacob felt guilty about how he extorted his own brother's birthright. He can't tell them, oh no, you have acted with deception, deceitfully. He did the same thing. He can't talk to them. He can't teach them a lesson because he lied to his own father and stole his brother's patriarchal benediction while being held by his own mother. He can't teach them a lesson because he would have to tell them how he tricked his own uncle when he was working for him. His name meant, meant usurper, trickster, someone who cheats. That's what Jacob's name meant. It's heartbreaking to see that Jacob was unable to restrain or discipline his sons when he could. And his sons didn't learn anything from this situation because eight years later, they almost killed their own little brother, Joseph. Then they decided to fake his death and sold him into slavery. Joseph was only 17 years old approximately the same age when this crime happened to Dinah. The last verse of the chapter, verse 31. Now you'll understand why Jacob couldn't reason with them. They retorted angrily, the Bible says, but why should we let him treat our sister like a prostitute? Hang on. <laughs> That's unfair. He didn't treat Dinah like a prostitute. Shechem was offering her an honorable marriage. She was going to be as a princess. Dinah went to see them very often. And usually when, when girls of that age go out in a place of strange, in a strange place, they go with their brothers or people to escort them. They don't slip out and go there on their own because the maidservants are just slaves to them. They will execute whatever orders they get. So it looks like Simeon and Levi has been condemned and justly Jacob might have might have had his own faults but at the same time what they have sentenced now been sentenced by Jacob seems to be fair because they did something very bad what chance are they going to have 
and we're going to look at this. On this slide, you see the family tree of Jacob showing his children only. And that is at the time of his death in, in 1859 BC. Now, you can see here, I don't know if you can see at the bottom, the names that are highlighted are the names of the children that were given a tribe. You see Gad, Asher, Reuben, Simeon. Simeon also was given a tribe. Levi was not. We'll find out later why. Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali. If you count, there's supposed to be 12 tribes, right? But if you count, how many are there? 10 only. Where are the other two? The other two are from Joseph. Because Joseph's sons in the previous chapter was directly adopted by his own father. He said to Joseph, Manasseh and Ephraim, now to the next slide, he said, Manasseh and Ephraim will be my own son. So on the next slide, you see these two names, Manasseh and Ephraim. They are the two sons of Joseph that were included. And we still don't see Levi. Simeon got away, but not very far. You'll find out. You'll notice that Simeon is awarded land within Judah's allotment. This is where Simeon is, right in the middle of Judah. He would have missed out because Judah's land was so big they couldn't take care of it. So they needed help. And that's how Simeon got part of it. The two sons of Joseph, Manasseh and Ephraim, were adopted sons of Joseph, of Jacob. And in that way, Joseph got a double portion instead of Reuben, even though he was the firstborn. The curse that Jacob pronounced over Simeon and Levi became true because it came from God. Bible clearly says that, and if you read the commentaries, you'll see that a lot of scholars say that it was under the power of the Holy Spirit that he spoke. It was God rebuking them himself. They were both scattered over Israel. Simeon's tribe was absorbed by the tribe of Judah over the years, and its population declined significantly. Just like Jacob said, he was scattered over Israel didn't get a second chance or maybe he got the second chance but didn't take it we'll see but 460 years later 460 years later this is it there the date is on top yeah 1399 BC when the children of Israel were giving land in Israel something happened Let's have a look. Exodus 32, 25 to 29 says this. Moses, do you remember the, the golden calf? You've seen that probably in the Ten Commandments. We used to watch this a lot of times when I was a kid. It's like um, Moses went on the mountain to get the Ten Commandments on the tablets. And then he spent six weeks over the mountain, which is more than a month. And then the people down at the bottom of the mountain said, where is he gone? We don't. We need a, a leader. Now, they used to have the column, the, the snow. Uh, sorry, not the snow. Snow in the middle of a desert. The, 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 um, a pillar of cloud during the day that was giving them shade. But it also represented the presence of God. And they knew God was with them. And by night, it was a pillar of fire which was keeping them warm. Because in the desert, it gets very cold at night. So... That was the presence of God. Obviously, because God was speaking to Moses on the top of the mountain, the pillar moved to the top of the mountain. I'm sure they could see it. Or maybe it was cloudy, they couldn't see it. Let's assume that. And because of that, they said to Aaron, make us a God. Moses saw that Aaron had led the people, and Aaron did. And that's how the golden calf came out. And the people started worshipping this golden calf. So verse 25 to 29 of Exodus 32 says this. Moses saw that Aaron had let the people get completely out of control. Most, 
much to the amusement of their enemies. So he stood at the entrance to the camp and shouted, All of you who are on the Lord's side, come here and join me. And all the Levites gathered around him almost immediately. All the Levites. And that's the descendant of Levi. And we see how things are going to change, how the second chance that's been given to Levi's generation is going to change their whole life completely. Moses told, me, told them, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. Each of you take your swords and go back and forth from one end of the camp to the other. Kill everyone, even your brothers, friends, and neighbors. The Levites obeyed Moses' command and about 3,000 people died that day. Then Moses told the Levites, Today you have ordained yourselves for the service of the Lord, for you obeyed him even though it meant killing your own sons and brothers. Today you have earned a blessing. And that was God cleaning the camp of people that left Egypt, but Egypt never left them. The golden calf is something that resembles what they used to worship in Egypt. And because God knew that nothing is going to change, no matter, and that's why he calls them stiff-necked people, because they wouldn't change their way. And instead of 40 days journey, it took them 40 years. God waited for the whole generation to go except Joshua and Caleb. Even Moses didn't see the promised land. He saw the promised land from afar, but he never set foot in it. So they went through the camp and killing all the people because they obviously didn't change their ways. They were still doing what they were doing. And they were involved in some of the most obnoxious kind of celebration. Because in those days when they meant worshipping the golden calf... There were orgies and all these things. There were one, one version of the Bible said he found them naked and everyone that was still celebrating were being killed until the people realized that, okay, we need to stop. Deuteronomy 10, 8 to 9 says this. At that time, the Lord set apart the tribe of Levi to carry, the ark, to carry the ark of the Lord's covenant and to stand before the Lord as his ministers and to pronounce blessings in his name. These are their duties to this day. That is why the Levites have no share of property or possession of land among the other Israelite tribes. The Lord himself is their special possession as the lord your god told them imagine that you lose everything you are scattered over israel and then god intervenes and said because you sided with me i'm going to give you better than what they have i'm going to give you me as your possession not the land i'm everlasting the land will be there for some time and then other generations. But for you, the priesthood, the Levites, you're going to have me as your possession. Numbers 18.21 says this. As for the tribe of Levi, your relatives, I will compensate them for their service. In the tabernacle, instead of an allotment of land, I will give them the tithes from the entire land of Israel. Can, and this is God saying this. Can you imagine that? Just because you sided with God, you don't have to work anymore. Others would work, work the ground, but you get a tenth of everything that they produce. Out of that, a tenth goes to God, and nine-tenths of that remains in their position. All they had to do is serve God. Look after the tabernacle, look after the people, and do all the rites and rituals, whatever needed to be done at that time in the tabernacle, serving God. And this is how the tribe of Levi was blessed 
all the days of their lives. They were scattered just like Jacob prophesied. Yes, because they were everywhere. They were in 48 cities. They didn't possess any land, but they didn't have to work either. They received a tenth from all that the other tribes produced. In Numbers chapter 35, the Bible says that the Levites were given 48 towns to live in across the land of Israel. All they had to do was side with God and serve him and the children of Israel. That's all they had to do. To thee that rule remains the same. Are we on God's side? Are you siding with God? Or are you siding with the pleasures of the world? Or do you have one foot in the world and one foot in God's camp? Which side are you on? Siding with God or being on God's sides, on God's side means to trust and obey Him and Him only. Serve Him means to have a close relationship with Him and follow Him and Him only. Notice that when Jesus, every time Jesus asked someone, when they said, what should I do? Or even to his disciples, he said, follow me. He didn't say, believe in me. He didn't say, go to church every Sunday. I'll just go and do your sacrifice or in the tabernacle or whatever, or in the synagogue. He didn't say all of that. He said, follow me. Are we following Jesus? Are we following God? Are we siding with God? And this is the question that maybe you have a lot of questions. And if you go through the text and... I'd really encourage you to, because this text has blessed me and has opened my eyes on many things that are today happening. There's not, if you look at the text clearly, you'll see some of the things are happening already now. This is not an old story. This is something that's still happening in the world. We see the cruelty. We see the barbaric reaction of nations or of people. See what's happening right now in Ukraine and Russia with the conflict between the two countries. We see how the Rohingya Muslims were pushed out of their land. We see all these things happening. But for us, what's our role? Are we siding with God? Because if you side with God, you don't have to worry about all these things. If you serve him, if you follow him, you don't have to worry about what is happening or what mistakes have happened because that was their second chance. Levi was not there to tell them, but they were smart enough to know, okay, if I have to choose God or something else, anyone else, I choose God. Simeon tribes could have done the same thing because there was no rule. All that Moses asked is, who is on God's side? Why the other tribes didn't do anything about it? But Levi's tribe was smart enough to say, I'd rather be on God's side than any other side. I leave you with this question. Whose side are you on this morning? Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the things that you have taught us, the lessons that we have learned this morning. And we pray, Father, that your word will be engraved in our hearts so that we can cherish it, but also, more importantly, so that we can feed on it. Help us, Lord, to grow spiritually through the things that you have fed us today. We thank you, Father, for your love, never-ending, your compassion, new every morning, your mercy renewed every day, and your grace always abounding, because without all of that, we wouldn't be where we are today. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.